He's a man who can be described as a Washington insider. He's been part of the U.S. government and foreign policy since the Reagan administration. He went to school with Hillary and Bill Clinton, and he was once the national security advisor to President Trump. His name is John Bolton. We spoke to him about his new tell-all book on the Trump White House and everything in between. Here are some excerpts from that exclusive interview. Mr. John Bolton, welcome to Beyond, sir. Thank you. Thanks for having me. My first question to you, Mr. Bolton, is why work for a man and give your loyalty to a man who, according to you, and I'm quoting from your book, offered personal favors to dictators, praised Xi Jinping for China's detention camps for the Uyghurs, somebody who thought Finland was a part of Russia, someone who thought it would be cool to invade Venezuela. These are all your stories. Why did you serve? as a national security advisor for someone who said and thought all these things. Right. Well, those are things that emerged during the course of the 17 months I worked there. I, I certainly didn't go into the job naively, uh, but I had had, I'd heard many criticisms about uh, President Trump, but I'd also had uh, a number of conversations with where, where I thought there was a possibility to work together. He had watched me on Fox News for 10 years. I assumed he was listening to what I was saying at the time. Uh, and I thought the United States faced a number of threats and challenges internationally where I could make a contribution. Uh, I think I'm not alone in uh, saying that it's it's an honor to work uh, for the for the government at a high level, and a number of us took that uh, opportunity and lasted as long as we could, basically. You're described as a Washington insider. You've worked closely with various presidents. How would you describe Donald Trump's relationship with India and India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi? Well, I think he has a good personal relationship with Prime Minister Modi. I, I think part of Donald Trump's trouble in international affairs is that he cannot distinguish between personal relationships with uh, other, other national leaders and the actual bilateral relations between the two countries. Uh, I think he saw that Prime Minister Modi was very popular among Indian Americans, people who have uh, come from the subcontinent or, or are born of Indian heritage. Uh, they had a big rally for the Prime Minister when he came to the U.S., the Howdy Modi rally in Houston. And he invited the President. Prime Minister is a good politician, too. And Trump saw that as a great way to be in front of tens of thousands of Indian Americans. And that shows what Trump's real focus is, which is his re-election this November. Since you've mentioned China, India and China have had a border standoff recently. Uh, the U.S. at the same time is redeploying forces from Europe to, to the Indo-Pacific, to South China Sea and elsewhere. If the situation between Beijing and Delhi were to escalate, would Trump clearly pick sides? And how far would he be prepared to go to, to back India, assuming that he chooses to back India? Well, I don't know which way he would go, honestly, I, and I don't think he does either. I think I think uh, he sees the the geostrategic relationship uh, with China, for example, almost exclusively through the prism of trade. I don't know what Trump will do after the November election once that guardrail is removed. Uh, I think he'll be back. He won't be uh, criticizing Beijing for putting the Uyghurs in concentration camps or repressing Hong Kong. He'll be back to the big. China trade deal. So if things were to develop between India and China uh, in, in a more critical fashion, uh, I'm not sure where he would come down. Let me make sure I've understood this right. You're saying that if things were to escalate between India and China at this moment, there is no guarantee that Donald Trump will back India against China. That's, that's correct. I don't, I'm not sure how much he understands the significance of the border clash in Ladakh. I don't think he knows anything about the history of these clashes over the decades between uh, India and China. He, he may have been briefed on it, but uh, history doesn't really stick with him. Uh, I think uh, his gut instinct for the next four months is take anything off the table that complicates what is already a difficult re-election uh, campaign for him. A word on his response to the coronavirus pandemic. In the last 24 hours, uh, the U.S. has recorded more than 63,000 new cases. Has the president failed on this count? Well, I think he's failed in many respects. I think there was an empty chair in the Oval Office in the early months. I don't think he uh, took the necessary actions. Uh, and it's a, good, it's a good example of a crisis for the U.S. and other countries where a strategic uh, response, a plan, 
uh, that one sticks to and adapts to the circumstances as necessary, and not the typical Trump ad hoc, anecdotal, on again, one day, off again, the next day approach, which is what he's followed and which I think is why we're still uh, in trouble with it. You've also written about India's Bala court strikes on Pakistan. How did the Trump White House assess what was happening and what was the message that you sent out to both India and Pakistan? Well, this took place when we were in Hanoi for the uh, summit, second summit with King jo Kim Jong-un and, and uh, uh, both Mike Pompeo and I were there and of course away from our base of operations in Washington. We spent hours on the phone with uh, Ajit Doval and others in India and with uh, counterparts in Pakistan. And uh, my assessment was, and I said publicly at the time, and I said to Ajit a couple days after as well, uh, we thought India had acted in self-defense. We thought the actions were appropriate. Uh, and we think that there were responsible steps taken to de-escalate what could have been a very serious crisis. Uh, what <laughs> <laughs> The Black Lives Matter protests have been on, and racism has become a political issue, more in America than anywhere else. But you've been quoted as saying that Trump is not a racist, though most of his statements suggest otherwise. What makes you say this? Well, I, I listened to him for 17 months, and I didn't hear him say things that I would consider racist. Uh, he's done other things that uh, that uh, that people have characterized as race, racist. I find uh, uh, any evidence of racism to be uh, unacceptable. If if I thought that were dominating his views in national security, uh, it would have affected my own decision on how long to stay. Uh, I think this is a very serious subject in the United States, but I don't, I don't think racism is something unique to the United States. Would you concede that America under Donald Trump is more divided than ever before? Well, I think it's become more divided, and I think in part that's due to Trump, but I think it's due to other factors as well. I think there's a rising left wing in the Democratic Party that's, uh, that's very troubling in its, uh, its view of America and its, uh, and its heritage. So there's, there's a lot of blame to go around here, but certainly part of it is due to Trump's behavior. You've also written in detail about U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo saying that he was a Trump loyalist, but he's considered quitting because he's been so frustrated. Uh, the fact is Pompeo still remains uh, in, in office in his post. Is the frustration, though, still there since you've worked so closely with him? And also, how, how does the rest of the team, how does the staff of Donald Trump see him and rate him? I'm sure they have conversations amongst each other. Well, you, you could certainly ask them at the appropriate time. I mean, I think Mike has higher political aspirations, and I think, uh, he, like, like others, he sees being tied to Trump as a plus from that point of view. I, I think it will turn out to be a negative, so my ultimate conclusion is I feel sorry for him. Do you think there are factions within the Republican Party against seeing Donald Trump at the White House anymore? And if there are, what explains their support for Trump during the impeachment trial? And they're, they're silent now when the U.S. is doing so miserably in the pandemic. Well, I think uh, the explanation for impeachment is they saw a partisan attack by the Democrats and they responded in a partisan fashion. I'm not saying that's a good idea. I'm saying that's the political reality of what happened. There was a recent poll that said something like 23 percent of Republicans would prefer a nominee other than Donald Trump this November. That's not going to happen. He is going to be the nominee. Uh, and I think at this point the election is a toss-up. I don't, I don't think we know who will win. Uh, but I think after the election, whether Trump wins or loses, there will be within the Republican Party a very considerable conversation. Uh, Donald Trump also wants to serve more than two terms as president. How do you rate his chances of serving more than one term? Well, I think uh, the election is very close. I don't think we know what the what the result will be. Uh, I think uh, he should be a one-term president. So for the first time in my adult life, I'm not going to vote for the Republican nominee because I just can't in good conscience after having served for 17 months. But you also said you'll not, not vote for Joe Biden. So then is it Kanye West? <laughs> no, I, I will write in the name of a conservative Republican, and uh, I'll make that decision between now and November. Mr. John Bolton, I'm so glad you could make time. Thank you very much. We wish you all the success for your book and for all your endeavors. Thank you. Well, thanks again for having me.